The contest for control of Manhattan Island in 1776 between the British and the Americans continued with the Battle of Harlem Heights. If you haven't seen my previous videos about the ongoing battle for New York, I've created a playlist so you can just check out the playlist and watch the previous battles. But just to quickly summarize, in the last two weeks, Washington has incredibly escaped certain defeat at the hands of the British on two occasions. One, when he crossed from Brooklyn Heights into Manhattan the night of August 29th, and the previous day, September 15th, 1776, when the British were delayed in their attempt to cut off Lower Manhattan. The army has now rejoined other parts and they are all in Harlem Heights. Washington has established a headquarters here at the Morris, today called the Morris Jumel Mansion and overlooks Manhattan Island. He writes to the Congress that although he's happy his army has made it to safety at the northern end of the island, he's dismayed at the amount of supplies they left behind in Lower Manhattan. Meanwhile, down in Lower Manhattan in the city, loyalists are celebrating the arrival of British troops. They believe they've been liberated by these violent rebels and are happy to see the British arrive. The British go throughout the town and all of the homes that have been abandoned by rebels or patriots or sons of liberty, whatever name you choose to call them, are all marked with the letters G.R., George's Rex, King George to show that they are now the property of the crown. So the British now possess the lower part of the island. Washington and his men are up here at the upper part of the island and Washington suspects that an attack may be coming soon. Washington is in a good position here at the northern part of the island and from the Morris Mansion, he has a good view to the south and the east, but an obstructed view to the west and the Hudson River. His view is blocked by something they call Bloomingdale Heights, we today call that Morningside Heights, and you might know that from Columbia University. Up here with Washington, the major commanders in this battle will be Thomas Knowlton with his rangers from Connecticut. Knowlton's rangers fought in the Seven Year or French and Indian War. They also fought in the Battle of Bunker Hill in Boston. They're very highly regarded and have a lot of military and fighting experience. Nathaniel Green and his regiments are here as well, as well as some other Continental regiments. But for this battle, we're mostly going to be concerned with Thomas Knowlton's Rangers and Nathaniel Green's men and Washington himself. Washington expects the British are going to attack him here, but hopes that their strategic position and the high ground will inspire his men to fight better than they fought in the last couple of battles. And you might remember he was quite upset with his men at the Battle of Kipps Bay, which would have been yesterday, um, for breaking ranks and simply running away from the British as they approached. So he's hoping that this will inspire them to stand and fight with more courage and bravery. The British attack comes just before dawn. And it kind of starts by accident as a number of these battles do when some guys from each side run into each other and start shooting. And the first advance will be stopped by Knowlton's Rangers where they will successfully engage the British and push them back. They'll come back up to Washington and report about what's happened and Washington and his men will prepare for what they know will be a subsequent British attack on their position. Knowlton's Rangers' successful holding off of this initial attack has inspired Washington's men to fight because now they feel like, well, hey, maybe we really can beat the British. If these guys did it, we can do it too. And the British do attack again. But this time, in order to insult and frighten the Americans, they have the bugles play the same bugle call they would play at a fox hunt. In other words, telling the Americans, you're nothing more but foxes were hunting in the woods um, in an attempt, obviously, to intimidate and frighten and insult them. Now, Washington knows he has inferior forces, but he does have a superior position. But what he's going to try to do here is draw the British into a valley that's just beneath his position, get his men to go down, draw the British in, then withdraw so the British will follow them further in, then flank them and attack them that way. And it goes pretty well. British fire on the Americans as they're coming into this valley, but reports from the Times say that the Americans bravely stood their ground, didn't panic and leave. Now, as the Americans withdrew, the British followed them, as I mentioned, into the valley. But all of this happened just a little bit too quickly. And when Knowlton's Rangers came up to flank them, 
they found that they met the British not behind them where they meant to, but on the side. This gave the British the ability to turn and engage them face to face. The fighting was quite intense and Knowlton himself took a musket shot in the back and was killed in this battle, as was another commander. His name was Leach. He took three shots and died a couple of days later. But this was a success for the Americans as the British eventually did withdraw from that point. So the Americans now have what they can think of as their first real success in the battle for New York. And although it's not such a great, you know, military win or or strategic win, it is a psychological win for Washington's men. Now the British by noon had withdrawn into a buckwheat field and the Americans followed them there. The Americans then withdrew themselves when they saw that the British were moving within range of their warships that were in the Hudson River. And of course, you know, they don't want to take cannon fire from those ships, so they withdrew. And the entire battle was finished by about 3 p.m. In total, about 1,800 Americans from every state participated. When the Americans turned and left the battlefield, they left with a united shout of hurrah, celebrating victory of the British, which the British said, of course, wasn't a victory at all. Now, very interesting. The British said this wasn't really a very meaningful battle, but they did conceal the number of their dead and wounded. And as the reports from the British came out, Washington countered them and said it was impossible that the numbers were that low because they themselves found more dead and wounded than the British were even reported. And General Howe is going to do this repeatedly in these battles in New York. He's going to play down the number of his losses. Although the British don't think much much of this battle or think it's very important to the Americans. It's a big psychological win. Remember, these are the same men who retreated in fear from the British only two weeks before. And now they've actually faced them and seen that they can stand and fight against them. So this is a big win for the morale for the American army. And Washington wrote to the Congress about this. He said, it did seem to improve their morale greatly. Washington wrote that it had converted the gloom of despair into the glow of animation inspiring his troops to keep moving on. Now, what I think is interesting about this battle myself, if you've taken my tours, you know that I really like to get into the dynamic between commanders and people and what's going on. And there are two fascinating things happening up here. The first is Thomas Knowlton, who some of you might know, has a young officer named Nathan Hale, who while this is going on, is spying for the American side on the other side of the island, the East River side of the island on the North shore of, of Long Island. And we'll be talking more about Nathan Hale in a few days. So that is going on in the background that Thomas Knowlton is here, but he also has an officer working for Washington elsewhere in the field of espionage. The other thing I thought was interesting is that there was a conflict over this battle between General Howe and Sir Henry Clinton, General Clinton. Some of you might know that General Howe and General Clinton clashed often in their beliefs of what should be done in the Battle of New York. Now, Sir Henry felt that the British should not have given away this spot, that it would have been easy to dislodge the Americans, they should have sent reinforcements, and they should have taken this spot, which would have put them into a strategic position to come up and around Washington later, rather than having to take a more circuitous route that we're going to talk about in an upcoming battle. So Sir Henry was not happy with the results of this battle. You may also know that Sir Henry and Sir Howe, or Sir William, I should say, you know, it's hard for us Americans to remember all these honorifics the way they use. Maybe I'll just use General Clinton and General Howe. Oh, and to confuse you a little bit more, there was a General Clinton in this battle on the American side that was General George Clinton. So we have two General Clintons as well. Um, but General Clinton on the British side and General Howe have already had disagreements over the battle for New York. One will be significant, and that is when they came in to take the island, General Clinton felt that General Howe should place a regiment not far from here on the only bridge that connected the mainland to the island. It was called the Kingsbridge Crossing. He warned Howe that they should place a regiment on the bridge and put warships in the water beneath it to prevent Washington from crossing off of this island if he needed to. General Howe, on the other hand, felt that Washington would never get this far. That it just wasn't wasn't worth the trouble because Washington would never escape the island, that they would defeat Washington on the southern part of the island or in Brooklyn, and it wouldn't even be necessary. 
So you can kind of see where Sir Henry is coming from at about September 16th, when he sees they've given up this strategic high ground and they have also not secured the King's Bridge crossing. The Americans have secured that crossing with General William Heath and his regiments. So you can see that Sir Henry is likely beginning to feel a little doubtful about Sir William's um, abilities to carry out the battle for New York. So that's the Battle of Harlem Heights. So, so far we have covered um, the British leaving from Staten Island, the Battle of Long Island or the Battle of Brooklyn, the Old Stone House, the retreat from Brooklyn Heights, Kipps Bay, and now the Battle of Harlem Heights. And in a few days, I will be covering the Great Fire of 1776 and what happened to Nathan Hale. I hope you'll subscribe so you don't miss that. Please like and share my videos. And as I always say, if you are in the New York area or are coming to the New York area, take a tour with me. I love to meet all of you. It's always so great to have someone come up to my tour. And when I say, how did you find me? They say, I follow you on social media. It's the greatest compliment ever to take a tour with me. So I hope I get to meet many of you. And for those of you not coming to New York, please comment and let me know how you like my videos and what you'd like me to cover about New York and the American Revolution. Until next time, I'm Mrs. Q, PatriotToursNYC.com.